You're still watching Ways Now. 2nd of February each year is World Wetland Day, a day set aside to raise global awareness about the vet, um, vital role of wetlands for people and our planet. This day also marks the date of the adoption of the Convention on Wetlands on the 2nd of February 1971 in Iranian city of Ramsa on the shores of Caspian Seas. Now, Wetland provides many societal benefits, food and habitats for fish and wildlife, including threatened and endangered species, water quality improvement, flood storage, shoreline erosion control, economically beneficial also for um, natural products for human use and the opportunities for recreation and education and research. So happy Wetland Day to all the water lovers. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wetland. Yes, so. Some very quiet and important things that you think it is not important, but exactly. when it's not there, you will now know the importance. <laughs> exactly. And then right. strikes a balance between the climate change mm, well, story. I hope so. Um, let me come to Maury. Let me take your story first. What did you find for us in the news today? So I come again bearing vaccine news. Um, as usual, I'm always having to handle the vaccine news. But this one is another good news, I think. So Nigeria is set to receive 57 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines over mm. the next few months. Uh, they have asked for a fourfold increase in their previous request for 10 million doses from the African Union. Addition. 6 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine are expected in February from the World Health Organization backed COVAX program. Um, I think that is actually good news. Like whenever I see vaccine news, even though I'm not sure whether I will collect it, I'm always very excited to come and share it because, you know, it sort of makes me feel like the government is working, you know, well, and planning towards having a way to eradicate COVID. So, I don't want to um, bust your bubble, Lami. Uh, I say, Lami, uh, Maury, did I you... Didn't I said, I don't want to bust your bubble. Did you watch the show yesterday? Yesterday. Because we talked about the, the vaccine, if truly it uh, um, should, should um, the vaccine if should be our important. priority, right? Mm -hmm. Our healthcare system, the number of people that die from infant mortality, maternal mortality, um, malaria, they are so, so high, right? So investing in COVID vaccine, well, I really don't know because the numbers really do not... Um, um, it's not something that should be really, really scary. Instead, a primary health care um, system that is not upgraded, you know, the should numbers be. of deaths should scare you more than COVID. So that's, that was our conversation yesterday. So I'm not so sure whether I want to take it again mm -hmm. as good news anymore. No, well, absolutely. Ooh, so I agree with both of you, actually. Mm. Like, you know, primary health care, delivery, uh, distribution, you know, maternal mortality. These are very present challenges, you know, in developing Africa. Nigeria, particularly, obviously, because of our population. But COVID is more real. It's like in front of us right now because we really cannot control how this thing is moving. We've been very lucky. Some people say it's God. Some people say it's the weather. You know, they just say all sorts of things. But, you know, you can literally sit here and your numbers will go from 1,000 to 1 million simply because you allowed flights to come from abroad. So, yes, we have to focus on tuberculosis and cholera and all these other things that other countries all over the world do not bother about anymore. But COVID is a very present challenge right now. So yes, we need to deal with the vaccination. We need to deal with all these other issues that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't, so, yeah, want to, right. I don't want to stretch it, but we need to still Are talk you sure about we need it. to dwell on this? <laughs> no, I don't want to stretch it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stretch it. But the truth is, right, um, COVID is not as deadly as, you know, you are saying it's in your face. You are not in the you are not in the hospital. You are not there to see all the data that proves that morta um, infant mortality, maternal, maternal mortality, mortality, are way way higher than COVID. And let me say this: mm -hmm. I feel that maybe it is because of overexposure to malaria that makes us maybe super resistant to the effect or the adverse effect of COVID, like other climbs mm -hmm. are saying. It's possible mm -hmm. that our own system it's is really it. yeah. Even the BCG vaccination for the so, children. It's a host of factors, you know, yeah. but. I mean, you're not too far from the truth. We mm. said it on this show, that rather than put up those huge marquees and spend billions just for temporary isolation centers, why did we not build sustainable healthcare centers? Absolutely. You know. Let because me come to Isi yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. Let me come Absolutely. to Isi, then I'll come to you, Tammy, for your final story. Okay, um, my story is a sequel to what I talked about yesterday in terms of um, Sheo Garaba, the um, aide to the president, who said that Nigerians should be indicted 
for the corruption, for high um, corruption um, uh, rating. Basically, um, now we have a feedback from a mockery, Reno Mockery. I'm such a fan of the man. Yeah. And he said, oh, yes, I am. He's so vocal. And he said that, um, basically, he said that he counters Garba, Shehu, and he said that Buhari's regime should be held accountable for corruption rating, not the Nigerian citizens. He said a few things, made some ex examples, including transparency, um, stated them transparency, accountability, and also harped on little examples such as Nasser and Danu, who was caught in Heathrow Airport, and he was um, de he de with some undeclared sums of amount, which was ranging up to millions of naira. And nobody was able to, you know, hold him responsible for it. And it was brought dollars. <laughs> dollars, and it was brought back to mm -hmm. Nigeria and smiling with the president. Mm. So this is another form of non-accountability, and it was um, also transparency. And you also talked about um, credibility of Garbashew, mm. that he is not credible, that he's a paid psychophant. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't take anything he says. Yeah. Heart. Okay, so this corruption issue, we're going to discuss it because everybody I has. I should. <laughs> Please, I should be on yeah. the show and not there. <laughs> You'll be in there. Uh, I'll be wherever you are going to. <laughs> that I've not released you yet. <laughs> Tell me, let me come to you <laughs> for your final story. Okay, yeah, so yeah, my story is uh, along the lines of, you know, governance as well. So the Lagos State House of Assembly has passed a bill. It's titled the Unlawful Societies and Cultism Prohibition Bill of 2020. And this is very interesting to me because one of the components of the bill states that there's punishment for parents of, you know, convicted cultists. So it, it's still something of a developing story at this time, you know. But Mr. Speaker alluded to the fact that when the bill becomes law, that parents will be punished if their kids are found to be guilty of cultism. And to my mind, you know, it's yet another bill that just leaves you wondering what exactly is happening. You know, so first off, anyone aged 18 and above is an adult. So nobody else should be punished for his own misbehavior. Exactly. And I totally agree with that, um, you know, narrative of parents having a role in raising a child. I get it, right? But society and institutions also have a role in raising these people. These young people are not engaged. Millions of them write jam. The schools can take only one tenth of that. And then if you don't know someone, you might not. You know, so perhaps we should focus on other things that can really help us prohibit unlawful societies. But when you say to me that you're going to start punishing parents, I'm just like, okay, is, is this a joke? What well, are another doing thing that? you need to also take into cognizance is that some children who are aged 13, 14 are actually in confraternities. You're talking of age 13 or 14. I'm Children just from you. primary schools have already started joining. Exactly, cult. and that, these are so the public this, schools. So this is this is a conversation I think it will be worth having, you know, Absolutely. because it's actually something interesting. I um, I don't know how it plays out, but I like the point that Timmy made about uh -huh. engagement. You know, you've not really engaged. I mean, I was coming to I was going to the mainland yesterday morning as mm. early as 7:30. I saw a very little boy, very little boy selling nose mask. And then, when you should be in school or at you, home. And I looked at that boy. That boy cannot be more than maybe eight or nine years old. Hmm. So why is the government leaving them on the streets? Tomorrow, that boy so, is a so potential cultist. And aside from that, that child will grow up to be a hoodlum at the end of the day. Yes, yeah, so that's, they are if big not issues. Yeah. Modified. Maury, do you want to come in or let's just move on? I think we should just move on because yeah. I kind of like agree with what everything they said is what I would have said. So <laughs> no, Wahala. All right, so today is a very interesting conversation. It's our open, uh, what's it called? Um, ladies' Night Out. So mm. we're going to be opening our phone lines late, much later, not now. <laughs> so we'll see you after the break. Stay with us.